Welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable Podcast. How are you today? Yeah, I'm doing really good. Thank you for having me today. Um, somebody just walked through the room then, sorry. But uh, I'm doing good. I'm excited to uh, be talking to you about all this stuff. Um, and yeah, let's just see where we end up, I guess. Yeah, this is fantastic. Thanks for zooming in from across the Atlantic Ocean to be with us today. We appreciate that. Uh, so, Ollie, let's get real. Tell us about yourself and what you do. <laughs> well, real is the key word. So my name is Ollie Anderson. I'm an author and I'm a coach. Uh, ultimately, I work in two main areas, but they're both linked by the idea of realness. Uh, so I, work, I do life coaching and business coaching. And the key theme that I'm trying to explore with people is realness. What is real about them? Their real values, their real intentions. How can they embody that in their creative projects or in their business or in just life itself? I've found through my own experience that we tend to complicate things. There's so much complexity in life, but actually, if you just take it to that really basic level of real or unreal, you can solve 99% of your problems as long as you act on what you learn. Another way that I often talk about it is either fragmentation or wholeness. So probably as we go through this conversation, those four words are going to keep getting thrown out. Real, unreal, and wholeness and fragmentation. For me, realness is just wholeness. It's connection to yourself, it's connection to other people, and connection to life at large. And the fragmentation, the unreal stuff, is all of the beliefs and ideas that we've picked up that stop us from uh, appreciating that. And I've found in life and business, again, if you can tap into the real stuff and you can move towards wholeness, connect to other people, make sure it's an expression of what's going on inside you, then things tend to work out. So I'm trying to reel myself in, otherwise I'll, I'll keep ranting and raving at you. That's the abridged <laughs> version. <laughs> well, thank you for that. You know, was, it, was there a point in your life when things weren't going well, when things weren't hitting all the cylinders? And then can you talk to us about what that was like in your life and how through growing through that, you came to this point? Yeah, so it's, it's quite a dramatic story. I'll give you the, uh, the short version, otherwise we'll be talking for hours. Uh, basically, I learned a lot of this stuff through having a long-term health condition. So the, the story is, when I was in my 20s, I went to Japan. Uh, I was teaching English initially, and then I started doing like, you know, movie extra work and modeling and all this kind of stuff. I thought I was on top of the world. I was living the high life. And then suddenly... My health just started to deteriorate. I thought I had flu, uh, but long story short, it turned out to be kidney failure. So I ended up in the hospital in Japan. I stayed there for a month. Then I had to come back to the UK because I needed a kidney transplant. Uh, I was on dialysis, still am. Waited a year and a half uh, for the aforementioned transplant. Had it. And then after about a week, it just went horrifically wrong. Basically, when they give you a transplant, they connect it to the artery in your inner thigh. For some inexplicable reason, it just burst. Like the, the kidney just burst open. There was blood all over the place. I was in a coma. <laughs> uh, they told my, uh, my family that when I woke up, I was going to have brain damage. So who knows? Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Uh, basically, because of that whole process, I just learned so much about how life works, how you know we're all hurtling towards death, all these kind of things that seemed quite bleak initially. But as I went through the process of kind of deconstructing my ego and becoming more aware of the way that life actually works, I realized that all that had actually happened was I just had the volume turned all the way up. And all of the things that I was facing by going through that, they were the same thing that everybody, every other human being on the planet is facing. Just because the volume had been turned up so high, it was so easy for me to, to gain awareness of, of what that was. And so basically through the process of kind of 
losing my ideas about myself and what I thought life was and blah, 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 and hitting rock bottom, I was able to rebuild and to distinguish, distinguish between what was real about me and what wasn't. Because actually all that happened when I hit rock bottom after the transplant was I just realized all of these different ideas I've been clinging to, all of these different expectations about you know, what life is and what might be possible and what I should be and what I shouldn't be and blah, blah, blah. All of those things were unreal. And the real stuff about me was still there. And so once I realized that and I started kind of taking responsibility for it, I guess, and taking actions and all the things that I had to do to, to kind of allow those seeds to grow, then things just started working out. And I realized even though it had been a bit of a roller coaster, it was actually kind of a blessing. And like now when I, I look back, I can kind of laugh about this whole kidney transplant thing and the, the journey I've been on because actually, despite how bleak it seemed back then, like now everything is actually kind of amazing. And I'm actually grateful that it happened because it showed me, you know, who I am, what life is and how life works. So that's the short version of all that. Well, I, for one, vote to not have my kidney explode. I prefer to hear the lessons you've gleaned from that, from your experience and not have to build them on my own. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's a good strategy. Yeah. I think that's a really important point as well. Cause actually you don't have to hit rock bottom. You don't have to, you know, have anything extreme happen to you to learn all these lessons. Cause actually what we're talking about is just life. It just works in a certain way. And you can either, you know, I believe if, if you, if you don't pay attention and you don't make some effort to raise awareness of what life actually is and who you actually are, then eventually life is going to call out to you anyway. Like it's always whispering to you. And if you don't listen, it's going to scream at you and it's going to slap you in the face. And that's when you end up hitting rock bottom or something, you know, bad mm -hmm. is going to happen to you. Bad in scare quotes, but actually because we're dealing with life. And it, the, the fundamental truth about life and reality is the same for all of us, which is just wholeness. You can do things no matter what your situation I have now found to kind of move in that direction. And this is why I like to keep it simple. Like I said at the start, it's all about either realness or un, unrealness, unreality, wholeness or fragmentation. And I think I am going to try not to make this too complicated. The process I normally walk people through is a three-step process. This is the process that I realized when I look back, I went through. So it's probably easier if I just tell you these three steps instead of running and raving about all kinds of weird different things. So the first step is awareness. Well, then it's I was going to ask a brilliant question about what are three things you could tell us about having, about Whoa. getting real with our life. It's <laughs> great that you read my mind and just offered Right, that. okay. <laughs> That's obviously wholeness in action right there. So the three steps are awareness, acceptance, and action. I have now found from my life and from coaching people in my coaching process that those three steps, awareness, acceptance, and action, they play a role in any transformative process that anybody is going through. Because ultimately, if you think about transformation, whether it's from unreal to real or from not having a business to having a business or any, any other thing you can think about in life, you have to go through those stages. Awareness means, okay, asking yourself the right questions, figuring out what you need to know, figuring out who you are, where you're holding yourself back, blah, blah, blah. Acceptance is about looking at where you've been holding back. Where are you purposely, even though maybe may unconsciously, where are you blind to the truth about life? What are you hiding? What are you disowning about yourself? And then action is obviously, I think, the most important step because if you don't take action, then you're not going to get anywhere. A lot of people sometimes forget that. So awareness, acceptance, and action, sometimes I describe it in a different way. It's the same three stages, but awareness is deconstructing the ego. I think when you first set out on these journeys of transformation, you have to look at your ego, basically your sense of identity that you have chosen and created in order to create the life that you currently have. And if you can reverse engineer your life, you can kind of understand your identity, if that makes sense. Like ultimately the way that we are related to ourselves affects the life that we end up building. So a simple example is maybe we have a lot of doubt 
or we think that we have to be too timid or whatever it is because of the way we've been brought up, then our life is going to be a reflection of that because we're not going to be taking the calculated risks that we need to take in order to get where we need to be. Maybe that's a bad example, but basically what I'm saying is the assumptions we carry about ourselves affect our lives. And so if you want to change your life, you have to start by looking at the assumptions you carry about yourself and see whether they're real or unreal. The thing is, when so people have been un... Can I hear real quick to ask a question mm -hmm. for clarification? So when you say deconstruct <clears throat> ego, what mm -hmm. I'm hearing that makes clean is that we all have a certain amount of assumptions we make about ourselves, our capabilities, our value, yep, uh, yep. what we can do, what we know, and deconstructing the ego might include telling a different narrative about ourselves or learning that we are more capable or more valuable or all yeah. of the, just writing a different tape to play yeah, ultimately. in our minds. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So the way that I look at the ego, it goes back to what I said at the start again. So it's either unreal or it's real. Or it, although the ego is never really real because it's a bunch of fragments. So it's either about wholeness or fragmentation. So the way that I think of the ego it's just all these fragments that we've picked up as we've gone through life and they cause us to hold back or to hesitate on acting on the wholeness that's within us that's trying to express itself out in the world. And it's things like you just said, so it's the stories that we tell ourselves, it's the expectations we have about life in order to compensate because of shame and guilt and trauma, it's the goals we might have picked up, all of these different things, they're all just fragments and concepts and ideas, but reality itself is beyond all of that stuff. Because if you think about it, uh, expectations, ideas, assumptions, opinions, blah, 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 all these things that make up our uh, sense of self in the, the smallest version of the self, they're all fragments and we need them because we're in fragmented bodies. We have to perceive life in this fragmented way. We have to interpret life to the best of our ability based on what we've been through. But the problem is if we attach to those perceptions and interpretations, then we just end up creating a, a kind of veil between us and life that ultimately affects what is possible in life. And if that we're, there's always going to be some kind of a veil because we're in our bodies, like I just said. You can't escape that if you're here on planet Earth. But if the veil is designed in a way that is a reflection of your underlying emotional stuff. So normally when I talk about this, I talk about shame, guilt, and trauma. If you have underlying shame, guilt, and trauma, they're going to create a little box for you to live in that is not an expression of who you really are because they're an expression of the shame and guilt and trauma, which are ultimately just blocks towards wholeness. And actually, I think you can dissolve those things by taking action and choosing a sense of purpose and all that stuff. But anyway, the ego ultimately is just a box that we create in order to survive whatever we think we've been through. But if we attach to the box and think that the box is real, then we fall into the trap of thinking that we are static, that we are never going to change. But ultimately, this whole wholeness fragmentation thing is about acknowledging that life is about change. It's about flow. It's about flux. Everything keeps moving because at the end of the day, we were talking about uh, these things we need to be aware of earlier in the conversation. At the end of the day, we're all going to be dead. And this is one of those things that I'm grateful I learned through this whole kidney thing. Like, okay, I'm going to die one day. Maybe that seems, you know, terrible, but actually it's another blessing because it shows you that everything keeps moving everything keeps changing, that you can keep expanding and evolving and growing and blah, blah, blah. But the only way you can expand and evolve and all these amazing things I've just said is if you let go of the ego's ideas, the box, the, the ideas of stasis, basically. And so deconstructing the ego is ultimately that. Becoming aware of all of these different ways that the ego makes you perceive and interpret life that are not real. So some examples are, like I just said, the ego makes you think that everything is static. The ego makes you think that cause and effect is not a real thing, that you can just click your fingers and get everything you want. The ego makes you think that you have to be perfect all the time, that you can control everything, blah, 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 blah. All of these different things stop you living a real life. And so deconstructing the ego, becoming aware, is becoming aware of those natural principles that apply to us all 
that if you align with, then you'll be able to have a better life without necessarily hitting rock bottom because you can just say, okay, one thing I need to be aware of in life, for example, is cause and effect. Okay, so if I want to get certain results in life, a certain effect, I need to be the cause that's going to do that. And then you can say, how do I do it? Blah, blah, blah. So that was a big ramble about awareness and deconstructing the ego. I don't know if it made sense, but yes. Yeah, that's helpful. I think in a practical way of understanding it is if someone sees potential in you and offers you a position or an opportunity, you might mm -hmm. say, oh, that's just not really who I am. And that's yeah. the ego talking. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But that first initial reaction is that's outside of my experience. I would have to grow into that. That would require mm -hmm. qualities of myself that have never been fully realized or worked upon. All of that stuff is ego. Yeah, I, I would say so. Because they're ultimately limiting your potential. And I, I think part of being real is understanding that we all have limits. Like, I can't lick my elbow no matter how hard I try, for example. But we all have way more potential than we tend to believe or that we think is possible. And so anything that causes us to hold back is just fragmentation. That's how I truly see it now. Unless, unless we've been real, like if there is a real limit, like it's very unlikely I'm going to jump out the window now and, and fly, you know, in the sky or whatever that is, that's real. But like, if it's me saying, oh, I can't start my own business. I can't write this book. I can't do this. I can't do that. That is unreal. It's some learned thing that we've picked up. And normally it's just a, a protective device that just seems to make life easier in the short term, but in the long term, it's just a denial of how amazing and blessed we can be. For sure. Okay, so number two. I know number three was action. Number one was awareness. And number yeah. two is... Number two is acceptance or integrating the shadow. So the journey I went through is deconstructing the ego, integrating the shadow, and then the third one is taking inspired action and building a life that I actually care about. So it might be helpful if I talk about how I see the relationship between the ego and the shadow. So the story of the typical human being, I'm always throwing this out all over the place, is pretty simple. It's the story of going from wholeness to fragmentation. And then if you're lucky, back to wholeness. So how that normally looks, we're all born, we're all whole. We're connected to life, we're spontaneous, we're not holding ourselves back. We're just following our impulses and our instincts and we're doing what we need to do. Obviously your instincts can get you in trouble sometimes, but in general, when we're kids, we're just very whole, we're very connected. We don't have all this mental chatter and the hamster wheel of the same old thoughts going round and round in our brains, holding us back from life. The thing is, as we start to get older, well, the world starts giving us all these external messages. Normally it starts with the word, no, 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 no. You can't do this. You can't do that. And then occasionally they start telling us we should do this and we should do that. I read something ages ago. I can't remember the exact uh, numbers, so I might be giving misinformation, but it said something like when, when we're young, we hear the word no, like exponentially more than the word yes. And apparently that contributes to us been kind of disconnected from ourselves in later life. Either way, no matter what the ratio is of yes to no's, something normally happens in people's lives where they start to feel ashamed of who they really are. Maybe it's their parents not liking their artwork or something. Maybe it's a bully at school. Maybe it's a teacher, whatever it is. Something will happen to most people that causes them to feel ashamed either of who they are completely, if that's even possible or of certain parts of themselves. And it, it could be their emotions, it could be their goals, it could be whatever. Actually, I'm just talking about shame, but also guilt comes into it. Because sometimes people want to do things and people try to make them feel guilty for it. So they hide those goals. Sometimes maybe they're angry about something. So people shame those emotions. The point is certain things happen to people and then they disown certain parts of themselves. When they disown these parts, that's when they end up creating this ego because the ego is a fragmented version of the whole and it's ultimately designed as a, a mask that we wear 
so we can pretend these parts that have been shamed or we've been made to feel guilty of, or in the worst cases, traumatized by whatever's gone on in the outside world. We put this mask on in an attempt to pretend those things no longer exist. Once that's happened, we become fragmented. Then as we get into adult life, we have normally reached a state where we've been wearing the mask for so long that we think it's who we are. And that is the ego that I keep talking about. And when that happens, you now have a situation where there's a dance going on inside of you between the mask that you're wearing, the box that you've put yourself in, and you're trying to live through because it's ultimately just a filter for life. There's a dance between the ego and all of the disowned parts of yourselves, of yourself that are now in the shadow territory. And so your shadow and your ego are basically in a battle. And the way that I look at it is, you know, I'm a bit of a broken record. The ego is just a bunch of fragments. It's, it's a box. It's not real. It's a survival device that helps you to function so you don't have to go through what you've already been through. But in the short term, you know, it's a good strategy. In the long term, you're going to feel restless. You're going to be depressed, maybe. You're going to be anxious because you're putting something false out into the world. So the fragments are what we put out into life. But in the shadow territory, all of these disowned parts are ultimately real. They're whole and they're constantly trying to get back to the surface. And so they're constantly trying to get our attention. This is what I was saying earlier. Like ultimately, these parts will keep whispering for our for us to listen, so we can kind of reintegrate them. Um, and if we don't listen because we're so attached to the ego, then something will happen. Like these things always come to the surface. They're basically guiding our whole life. Um, there's a quote by Carl Jung. He said something like, "I can't remember verbatim, but you know, until you discover the unconscious, which is where all the shadow stuff is." It will rule your life and you'll call it fit. And I think a lot of the time, there's all these things going on in people's lives, like the same patterns keep repeating or they'll keep attracting the same scenarios into life, whatever it is. And it's their unconscious trying to get their attention. And if you learn to listen, then you can actually kind of bring these parts back to the surface. Maybe it's your anger. Maybe it's some goal that you denied that you, you know, you want to start acting on again. I was talking to someone recently. They always wanted to be a singer, but they never did anything about it. And now they've reached their sixties and they're actually going out there and singing. That's been there the whole time. And they created this little box to live in where that wasn't even a possibility, but eventually people reach, reach that breaking point where they're like, oh, this is the real me. This is what I need to do. And it's because they've raised that awareness and then they got to the second stage, they've accepted it and they've brought it to the surface. And, um, one final thing I should say in this little rant about the shadow stuff. People tend to think that all of the things down there are bad things, but they're not. It's beyond good and bad. So like maybe your anger's down there. Maybe your um, desire for affection is down there. It could be, literally, it could be anything. But ultimately, if you don't bring it to the surface and integrate into the actions that you're taking and the direction that you move again, you'll always feel fragmented and disconnected from life because those things are the real you and all any of us need, I have found and truly believe all any of us need is to feel real. And the way we do that by raising awareness of this ego, what am I holding back on? Blah, 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 blah. Why do I believe that I'm not capable of whatever it is I want to do? What's down there? How do I bring it up? And you can bring it up through action, which is the third step. Well, tell us a little bit about action. So the important thing about the action stage is if you don't raise awareness and you don't go through the process of, process of acceptance, then the actions that you take will be unreal. And I think a lot of people fall into the trap of being a human doing, as people say, instead of a human being, because they don't do this inner work first. And obviously it's, it's hard to do it. Like it's one of the hardest things in the world facing yourself, but if you don't do it, then ultimately you're just wasting your time because all of the actions you're taking are going to be unreal. They're going to be inspired by or motivated by your programming, all of the, the conditioning that you picked up from the external world, which is not a reflection of your true values and intentions. It's going to be a reflection of your self hypnosis and the ego and the desire that you have, the unconscious desire. 
to hide your real self from yourself. And so you're constantly going to be doing things. You're constantly going to be busy distracting yourself. The way that I look at it, it's good to be busy if you're moving towards the truth. It's bad to be busy if you're just distracting yourself. And so ultimately it comes down to two things. You're either taking action to move towards the truth or you're taking action to keep running on the spot in an attempt to hide from the truth. But I truly believe that the, the truth will set you free, but first it will pee you off and it will make you miserable. And the reason it will pee you off and make you miserable is because it's a threat to the ego, basically. And people think they need the ego because it protects them in the short term from all those underlying things that we were talking about, shame, guilt, trauma, whatever else is down there. And the truth is always going to bring that to the surface. It's going to hold it out in front of you. And it's going to show you that your identity you've created for yourself is not real. And who wants to think that about themselves, really? And so this is why action is so important, but it has to be inspired action, which means you're cultivating the conditions for you to be able to listen to yourself and to make sure that what you're doing comes from that place of wholeness, that place of realness, instead of the, the ego stuff. And the shortcut to doing that, that I've found works for a lot of people is just dive deep inside yourself. Not so deep that it's painful, but just start with something simple. Figure out your true values. What, what do you really value? Most people, you know, we, we have, we value creativity, for example. That's why I'm always talking about that. Truth is something we should, we can all value and get benefit from because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. Uncover the truth and then put it into some kind of action. If you do those two things, then your life will be amazing. But the thing that stops us is the ego. So anyway, action is any real action is inspired action that is going to move you towards wholeness instead of the same old fragmentation that's keeping you where you don't want to be anyway. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is pursue the uncomfortable to jump into yeah. the hard <laughs> growth. Yeah. Yeah. So a common thing in coaching, there's, there's three levels. So you, you probably heard it, right? There's the comfort zone, the stretch zone, and the panic zone. Being real is about putting yourself in the stretch zone or finding your edge. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just go through this. Comfort zone is when you just, you're in the box of the ego. You're doing what is not going to change anything. It's going to keep you in the same emotional level, the same intellectual level, and the same spiritual level because you're just controlling everything basically in an attempt to remain the same, which is impossible because life keeps changing and we're all moving towards death. Like we said, the stretch zone is where you're getting to a place just outside that box and it feels good. I always tell people when you get there, you feel a kind of creative tension because there's, it's kind of a natural tension that comes from exploring the gap between where you currently are and where you want to be. And if you stay in the ego, I'm, I'm gesticulating a lot in this, in this podcast, but if you stay in the box, you're not going to feel alive. You're not going to feel that creative tension because you're not expanding, you're not growing. And because when we've been real, it's always about wholeness. Well, wholeness is in our experience as human beings is always about that feeling of expansion. And so creative tension getting in that stretch zone, getting, feeling the edge of what you currently know is where you will feel, you tr feel truly alive and truly get the results that you want. The other thing though is if you go into the panic zone, which means you go too far, further than what you're currently ready for, then you'll feel bad. You'll literally panic. You put stress on yourself. You'll feel out of balance. You won't get results because you're trying too hard. You've been outcome dependent, all that kind of stuff. And so the skill that we need to develop or the attitude we need to develop is about being honest with ourselves, honest enough to say, right, am I really stretching myself now or am I pushing myself too much because of my ego stuff? Like I'm trying to compensate. I find that a lot of people who end up in the panic zone, they have a lot of underlying shame and stuff like that. And so they try and do too much to try and compensate for those feelings of shame, to try and make themselves feel big because they feel small inside. But actually. That just exacerbates the problems because if you do put yourself in the panic zone, well, you're not going to get the results. And then it opens up this negative spiral where things go from bad to worse. And so being real ultimately is, I always talk about riding the reality waves. 
reality is about wholeness. It's always going wherever it's going to go. Your job when you're going real is to find a wave that is going in the direction you want to go in and ride it. And for me, that's how I like to think of the stretch zone because you have to stretch to maintain your balance and stay on the wave. But at the same time, you're not falling into the ego's trap of trying to force everything. We're trying to control everything. I think that's the big lesson. Like ultimately this all boils down to you're either forcing life, which is ego, or you're flowing with life, but you're not flowing in a way where you're so open-minded, your brains fall out. You're flowing in a way where you're doing everything you can, but then you leave the rest to God or the universe or whatever you want to call it. And that's the sweet spot, but you can, if you get there, that's stretching. So I don't know if I answered the question there. Sorry. It was brilliant. Thank you, Ollie. And friends, if you're listening, you heard it here. Make sure you pursue the uncomfortable. You can grow <laughs> from it. You can grow through it. And you will get real with yourself and your life. Ollie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much.